Welcome to Soul of Travel podcast. Today is a really fun and exciting day. I am sitting down with Nikki Vargas, who wins our returning guest award. Um, she's been here like in seasons one, two, and three, and here we are in season five. And uh, while she wasn't in season four herself, uh, I talked with your good friend, Esme Benjamin, and you landed right in the middle of that episode. So in a way, you've been with us all five seasons, um, <laughs> but I'm so glad that you're back here today. Thank you so much for having me. I love that I have almost been in every season of this podcast. It's just, it's amazing. I love talking to you. I love this podcast. So it's really my honor. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, well, I will encourage our listeners to go back and listen to the past episodes if they want to hear more about Unearthed Women and Wondrous, um, two things that I really loved Um talking to you about, but we won't hit those today. Um, today, we're here to talk about your most recent project, which is your book, Call You When I Land. Um, yep. We were just talking before we hopped on how fun it's been for me to be able to read this. And I have a few other friends that have written travel memoirs, and it's such a interesting experience reading someone's journey when you know parts, but obviously not all the parts. So it's been fun to kind of like peek behind the scenes. Um, so I can't wait to get started and I would love to give you the opportunity to just introduce yourself to listeners who might not be familiar with you and let us know who you are. <laughs> of course. Hello listeners. Uh, <laughs> my name is Nikki Vargas. I am a travel writer. I am a travel editor. I'm a senior editor at Voters Travel. I'm also an author. Call You When I Land is my travel memoir that came out in November from HarperCollins. And my first book, Wanderous, which I was co-author on, is an exhaustive women's travel guide, very much inspired by a travel publication I founded in 2018 called Unearth Women, which really just aims to champion women within the travel space. So my entire career is very much rooted in travel writing about travel, traveling, speaking about travel, all things travel. Yeah, I love it. And it's funny because last time we were here, I showed you my copy of Wanderous, but I haven't sent you the picture yet, but my copy of Call You When I Land is completely destroyed because I just took it. I was literally reading this in the Amazon. It felt like the perfect like <laughs> tribute to be reading it in the middle of the jungle. Um, but it's all like so water much. warped. <laughs> I really, really love that. Honestly, that's like the best compliment. Like if I can see my book out there in the world with you getting like bent and dirty and sand in its pages and water worn and everything, like that's the sign of a book well-traveled and well-read. And that is what I intended. Yeah, I love it. Um, well, I would love to start with, which perhaps might be the most obvious question, but I know finding a title for a book can be a really arduous task. Um, mm. It's like putting the icing on the cake. And I know maybe some people start there and then that shapes it. But I'm wondering, what is the significance for you of Call You When I Land? Well, Call You When I Land is really a coming of age journey, as you as you well know, having read it. So there's a lot in there. Not only is it about travel, but it's really about finding yourself stumbling around in your 20s. It's about calling off a wedding. It's about chasing a career dream. It's about embracing your heritage. There's even a little bit of a murder mystery in there. So there's a lot of transformation and evolution. And originally the title was Shifted in Flight. And the idea being that as I was sort of moving through the world and kind of growing as a woman, that I was also kind of shifting along in this journey to the person I would become. And then in conversations with my publisher, it was felt that Shifted in Flight wasn't an obvious enough title for the fact that it's a travel memoir. So we all sort of went back to the drawing board and we're trying to think of different names. And there was a few funny ones thrown out there. Like, I believe one name that was floated was, this is your final boarding call. And I was like, that sounds so like doom and gloom. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was talking to my husband one day and we were bouncing ideas off each other and the name Call You When I Land came up. And what I love so much about it is that there's two meanings to it. There's the obvious meaning of, I'll call you when I land, what we tell our loved ones when we're about to take off. But then there's also this symbolic meaning that complements the book so well, 
which is I will call you when I figure things out. I'll call you when I land on the person I'm meant to become, on the career that I'm meant to have, on the relationship that feels right. And that's why I love the title so much because I think it really encompasses this coming of age transformative journey where in the very end, it really is landing on the person I meant to be. Yeah, thank you for sharing all of that. And um, I love that you just kind of walked us a little bit through the full journey as well. Um, I think it's something that so many of us relate to and we'll maybe talk about this a little bit later, but what it's like to actually go back and mm. reflect and pull all those pieces together because I think you know we we all have our lives experience but we don't always take that moment to intentionally reflect on how we've gotten where we are and mm. what it means to kind of embrace that and really land somewhere so I appreciate you sharing that um yeah, I know that travel was a really important part of your childhood um both with your father's love of airplanes and your family travels and I really, really loved hearing your dad's story in the book. I was like, oh, he is the best character. Like, obviously <laughs> he's your dad, but reading him, I really enjoyed just his passion. And I could kind of see how that came through into your storyline. But I was wondering how that really set a foundation for your desire to travel. Yeah, my dad has always been a dreamer. He's always dreamed of being an airline pilot. He still dreams of like flying like a plane. And he's always kind of had this fascination with aviation and just traveling as a whole. And that passion was really instilled throughout my childhood in the form of family trips that were pretty unique for childhood trips. You know, my my family and I, we would go to Russia to St. Petersburg and spend three weeks in St. Petersburg, um, living in Nevsky Prospect, going to the Hermitage, exploring. Then we would do another like couple weeks in the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, visiting local Mayan communities. So it was a very kind of different style of family travel than um than some of my peers were having at that age, which at the time I did not fully appreciate, but as an adult, I really do. And my dad and I just really had a bond with travel. We would, a detail in the book, we would go to the airport and this was pre 9-11 and just watch planes take off and watch people boarding flights and pretend that, you know, we could just board one of those planes and where would we go? And he used to love watching, um, the planes take off from O'Hare International Airport in Chicago. And so we would drive the family car out there and lay on the roof and watch the planes go. So there was always this love of transporting yourself and of travel. But as I say in the book, my dad's fascination with aviation was different from my fascination with just stepping outside of what you know. And that's a magic that I still really am drawn to. I love the ability of travel to pull you out of your comfort zone and pull you out of routine and show you something new, whether that's an hour away from where you live or on the other side of the planet, that to me is really the magic of travel. Yeah, I agree that that uh, that way that you feel as you kind of grow and evolve and like travel constantly puts you up against something new and mm really forces you to, 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 to become someone new in order to kind of, to move through that situation. And, yeah. um, this really leads into the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about, which was in reading about your early travels to Paris, I strongly connected to both your inability to pronounce the town you were staying in because I was just <laughs> in Paris this summer and visited a friend south of Paris and I will not try to pronounce where we stayed <laughs> um my daughter could do it perfectly and my friend would say it and then I would repeat it and she would look at me like I don't know what you just said I'm like I don't know what I just said that was wrong I don't know what we're, I don't know what's happening um so I really loved that part of your story because I've really just recently experienced that um but then also like as I've traveled there have been those moments when I feel myself really lured to stay in the safety of my hotel room and mm. overwhelmed by like what might be lurking outside of these four safe walls. And I think that many of us create this kind of romanticized version of who we'll be when we travel. Like 
oh, we imagine yeah. ourselves being like the most fashionable and the most witty and the most brave and magically like multilingual. <laughs> um, and then all of a sudden you get there and you realize that this person you concocted, this traveler you will be is not who you are. <laughs> and so yeah. you are sitting here in this room and like trying to force yourself to be that version of yourself you wanted to be when you traveled in the first place. So I wanted to talk to you about like, what do you still find yourself caught in those moments? And also what might other people do to encourage themselves to step out of the safety of that hotel room if they're also feeling that same hesitancy and resistance? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. In the book, in the first part of the book, um, I speak a lot about using travel as a tool of avoidance, using it as a means to run away. And there's that saying where wherever you go, you find yourself. And I think when I start the book in this like very turbulent time where everything is very messy and I'm just kind of avoiding my life in all the wrong ways, I use travel as a way to kind of get away from my reality. And I keep finding myself wherever I go. And it could be on a speedboat in Miami or on a riverboat in Borneo or wherever it is, I keep kind of coming up against myself. Now, as an adult, uh, now, you know, at 36, I have more of an appreciation and understanding and maybe patience with myself than I did back then, which is to say that when I go out into the world, I understand that I can be a little nervous and it can be scary to step out of the comfort of your hotel room because you've just stepped out of the comfort of your home. And it's okay to take it step by step and day by day. It's okay to listen to yourself and say, you know what, today I just want to walk around my immediate vicinity and get familiarized with my area. I don't need to be this version of myself and put pressure on myself like that. And it took me a while to get to the point where I'm more accepting of who I am and how I am when I travel. And that's really my advice to people as well, where you may have an idea of yourself when you step out into the world that you're going to be spontaneous and free and striking up conversations with strangers at a Parisian cafe, and you're going to be more charming or sexy or adventurous than you are back home. But the truth is, is wherever you go, you meet yourself. And rather than create such pressure and, and really guilt and shame because you're not living up to this expectation, allow yourself to just be and do what feels right. And it's okay to move at your own pace. And it's okay to decide that you want to spend that day at a cafe, people watching versus doing something incredibly adventurous or spending the day at a museum, whatever it is. And um, I find now especially post pandemic, post lockdown, that it's a lot harder to feel comfortable outside of my comfort zone. Whereas maybe it was a bit easier beforehand, certainly in my twenties, but now I really do have to give myself grace when I leave my comfort zone, when I go out into the world and allow myself permission to just take it slow. Yeah. Um, I love that you kind of mentioned what it feels like to travel before the pandemic and now, and even yeah. as someone that I would say would be a very savvy and, you know, uh, well-traveled person to recognize that it feels different to travel mm -hmm. um, because I also just have spent some time traveling and that's something I kept noticing about myself, but I, I don't think I actually had that awareness is that I felt that sense of insecurity or not being safe kind of lurking around me and mm -hmm. didn't really realize that it probably comes from that space where we were all living where everything felt so vulnerable and unknown yeah. and and now taking that out into the world it, it somehow seems like still ever present like I think that that volatility just hasn't gone away and I yeah. notice it and it absolutely persists even beyond the pandemic. There's a lot of volatility out in the world right now. And when you're home, it's almost like you're in bubble wrap. You're in your safe space. You know what to expect. Things feel cozy. Things feel comfortable. And there's a real beauty in that. And then, of course, when you step outside of that and you break off that bubble wrap 
and you're in a new city and you don't know anyone there and it's far from what you consider your safe space and comfortable, there's a fear that comes with that and that's okay. And I think that it doesn't need to necessarily reflect poorly on you as a traveler or as a person that you're not immediately comfortable wherever you're dropped in the world. And my career is traveling. I work, as I mentioned, as a travel editor for a big publication, and I still feel that way. And I would never fault anyone for choosing to spend a day at their hotel room, just acclimating to the fact that they are in a new place. And so I, I think it's the pressure around being a certain type of traveler, needing to experience a destination in a certain way that can make travel not enjoyable. And that's something I really want to try to push against. Yeah, I love that. Um, so one of the moments early in your book, you begin your first solo trip to Columbia. This is something I, I highlighted this sentence. Um, where you you started this trip with this thought of we were building a future together while ignoring the fact that we long to walk entirely different paths. And mm. I was like, oh, I can I can really relate to that. And you were referencing your relationship with your then fiance. And then you end the trip with this other moment that also caught in my chest with this young girl who connects with you on the beach and says, eres un pajero libre. Mm -hmm. And she sees you in a way that you long to see yourself. And she says to you, you are a free bird. And so many of us, I think, have been here on a path that feels out of alignment with the whispers of our soul. And this, when this little girl sees you, I wonder, like, what does that awaken in you? I think, you know, that moment was so pure and magical because, you know, I'm in Colombia I have my fiance back home in New York. I'm skyrocketing towards this wedding that does not feel enjoyable to plan, does not, doesn't feel right. But instead of stepping back and acknowledging it and seeing the red flags for what they are, instead I'm blaming myself. And I'm sort of expecting that my doubts will kind of slough off my skin with time. And I'm not really having a conversation about what's really happening. So when I'm on this beach in Cartagena at Boca Grande, this little girl who comes up to me and sees me on the beach, just, you know, writing in my journal and staring out at like the ocean and whatever, she just comes up to me with just such childish innocence and just like plops down on the sand and is like, what are you doing? You know, why are you doing it? Where are you from? Just like, you know, con like classic kid questions. And that moment was so magical to me because she was so in awe of the fact that I was in Colombia without family, that I was on this beach, that I was just writing in my journal, that there was no one around me, and that I was hailing from the city, New York, that to her was just this incredible, magical place. And she just decided right then and there that I'm a free bird. And that's what she expressed to me in Spanish. And what I love so much about that moment is that I did not feel that way at all. I felt completely tied down to the wrong career, the wrong marriage or impending marriage, the wedding, everything felt messy and wrong and confusing. I felt anything but free. But when that little girl said that to me, I could see myself through her eyes. And it was the first moment where I felt like I could become that. And that in many ways, I think was a catalyst for trying to dare to see my life in a way that it wasn't. Because, and what I mean by that is, you know, you have your life, you see what everything is in this moment in time, but it can be hard to imagine what it could be. And the way that girl saw me kind of gave me permission to look at my life and imagine what it could be if I dared to make some changes, which eventually a few months from that point, I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just loved that moment so much because I, I think it really sometimes takes someone seeing us, mm -hmm. like you said, to give you permission to even imagine that for yourself or the way that some people have an innate ability to see the truest part of you. So mm -hmm. really that I think was who you were. You just weren't 
who weren't living in that way in that moment. And um, I think yeah. that can be some of the, the the greatest gifts that we receive from people is just them witnessing who we who we truly are. Yeah, it's a it's a change in perspective, you know, because we are the stars of our respective lives and we are in it. You know, and when you're so in your own emotion and in your own drama and in your own life, it can be hard to sort of step out of that and get perspective on yourself and on your life and where it's going and what you need. It's really hard to get perspective, let alone unbiased perspective. So to have those magical moments with strangers when they just off the cuff say something so impactful that has a way of of throwing your life into a new view it's really powerful it's really really powerful and that little girl uh she did that she probably has no idea (laughs) I I think I love that too because you never know the power that you hold over someone else and you never know like something that can be said in passing and I've had that too where I've said something just quickly to someone and they come back later and they're like you know that I didn't have that awareness about myself and you just saw that thing in me. And I I have completely like changed course because that is what I also wanted to see in myself. So I think it happens to people, you know, maybe more often than we would realize. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Magical moments. Yeah, I definitely believe so. Um, And you mentioned a little bit for, before about kind of the beginning of your book, you're really talking about travel is this place of escape. And that, you know, you were pressing pause, like it was this this moment where you could disconnect from this place that you didn't really want to be. Um, And I think for a lot of people, we use travel that way or travel is painted that way, you know, that's like these weekends to go and drink and be on the beach and be oblivious to what is happening in the world or Mm. happening in our own worlds. But then I think what happens for some people is that they realize that travel is this place where we can actually reconnect to our true self. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how travel has offered you that clear view. And, you know, the other part of that is not only like the, the view we get of ourselves while we're traveling, but then there's this moment of landing, which is important that we just talked <laughs> yeah. about, but landing back in your life. And even yeah. if you're happy, even if you're returning to the life you want to return to, it can be a little dizzying and unbalanced. And for example, like just last week, I was like, two days ago, I was on the Amazon in Peru and today I'm in driveline. <laughs> and it's <laughs> like, it's very hard to kind of integrate those two parts of ourselves. And when you travel a lot, you're bouncing kind of between these two spaces of disconnect, connect, like Mm. unreal and real, and your brain is trying to process it. So I'm wondering for you, like one, how travel has been valuable for that clarity and two, how you navigate that reintegration process into your real life over and over again. Well, I have to say the disconnect connect is it's very real. It's very, very real. And beyond the fact that you yourself are kind of stepping into this dream world where everything is just fantastical and adventurous and beautiful and spontaneous, and then you step back into your reality. There's also the fact that if you're, you know, solo traveling or if you're going on a press trip or whatever, and you're not bringing your loved ones with you, there's also a disconnect with your loved ones back home where you're trying to convey to them what it felt like to glide down the Amazon on a river boat or have this experience with Komodo dragons in Indonesia and words can only go so far. And so it's, it's really hard, I will say. And I used to struggle with it a lot in my twenties, especially the financial aspect of it. Because when I was in my twenties, I'm working an entry-level job. I'm living in New York city where I still am. I'm barely affording rent. And these press trips that I were taking were really the only way that I could afford to travel, which is to say that they would fly me out to destinations or hotels in exchange for writing stories. And that was the biggest disconnect because I would go to these places and stay in hotels that I could never afford at this moment in time and have these experiences that I could never afford. 
And then I would go back home and it would be living paycheck to paycheck and pinching pennies and eating ramen for dinner. And so that was even a larger sort of discombobulating disconnect as well at that age of like how to marry this career and all of these sort of lavish and luxury experiences that were kind of happening by virtue of these work trips with my reality in New York. And it's, um, it's very disconcerting, but I will say that as I've gotten older, I think much as I was saying earlier in our conversation, there's just a level of giving yourself grace and of just allowing yourself to be. And I also try to save trips that I feel are special to me for loved ones. So for example, Vietnam is a place that I had always wanted to go and I had gotten press trip offers and I turned them down because it was a place that I knew I wanted to experience with my now husband. And I'm glad I saved that destination for us because even though it's disconnecting to step outside of your life and go somewhere and have these incredible experiences, the part that was the hardest for me was not being able to share that with someone I love and telling him in retrospect, oh, you know, what it was like to move through Hanoi without him really experiencing it firsthand. So now I really try to be more um, discerning about the trips I do for work and the trips I want to save for my loved ones so that there is that connection there that I can enjoy with my husband or my sister or my family or whoever it is I'm traveling with. Um, but to answer your first question, the clarity travel has given, you know, for as much of a disconnect as there can be, I think that disconnect is also important when it comes to sort of epiphanies and learning things about yourself. And it all goes back to this idea of breaking routine and breaking away from your comfort zone. So in my case, breaking out of New York, breaking out of routine gave me the clarity to call off a wedding, to confront myself, to realize that I was skyrocketing in the wrong direction in my life. It gave me the clarity to change course in my career, to realize that I was being very passive and taking a back seat in my career and that I should really be pulling my passion for travel writing out of the corners of my life and sort of thrust it into the sunlight because that is what I want to do with my life. And these moments, which I share in the book in almost like vignettes rooted in destinations, I don't know if they would have happened without me stepping outside of my life and my comfort zone and allowing myself space to confront myself. And I think that's really the magic of travel is when you allow yourself space to just be with yourself and think about things that you're not thinking about when you're on the day-to-day -day and moving from to-do list and errands and everything that our lives demand. And uh, that to me, you know, it's not to say I needed to run away to Argentina to call off my wedding. I do wonder if if I had just gone to upstate New York, maybe I would have screamed into the forest and like the Adirondacks, who knows? But the point is, is that I allowed myself the opportunity to break with routine and be alone with myself. And that gave me what I needed to move my life forward. Mm -hmm. um, I thank you for sharing that. And the thing that you mentioned that I hadn't really thought about before as you were kind of painting that picture of being the travel writer in this hotel that you could have never afforded and um, that sense of disconnect, I think a lot of times um, we can feel a sense of imposter syndrome and I'm seeing, I'm like, oh, that's exactly where it's coming from because, you know, how do you feel like you could be the person to write about these experiences when sometimes they are completely foreign to your own reality, not literally, not just because you're in a foreign country, but because it just wouldn't be an experience that you would truly live. Yeah. And I think I, you know, I've seen that in people's businesses or as they're writing and they, and they have these incredible experiences, um, you are tackling kind of that emotion as you're moving through it as yeah. well. And I hadn't thought about it before until you just were saying that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I, I think it's something that's hard to talk about within the travel media industry, because obviously it's a real blessing and privilege to be able to experience these things and not only to experience them, but to be able to experience them 
usually for free by virtue of being a travel writer, editor, content creator, influencer, whatever it is, or, or travel agent when you have these trips. Um, so I think because there's such a privilege attached to it, I think talking about sort of the discombobulating effect of it and the emotion is not often done because you know, you, you never want to seem ungrateful for these situations and, and you're not, but there is also a real imposter syndrome, as you said, where you're enjoying these moments that many other people save years for. And I have, um, you know, one experience I had, I remember I went on a creator trip, which was, uh, in partnership with India tourism. And I went on a trip with maybe 18 other travel writers, creators, bloggers on a train that took us around India. We went to Varanasi and Del New Delhi and everything. And this was a luxury hotel basically on wheels. And I remember that the people on board that were not part of our group were visibly disgruntled by the fact that we were there. And it was a much older demographic they had saved a lifetime for this experience. And then just imagine the disconcerting effect of having a bunch of 20 something year olds come on board and they're enjoying this, this high ticket item for free. And, you know, there was a real level of um, imposter syndrome of insecurity there. But what I will say, and that trip ended beautifully is that on our last night on that train, they threw a party where we all just kind of were dancing on this moving car and the passengers that were there that weren't part of our trip, they ultimately loved the company of just having like younger folks on board and they joined us and we were all dancing and it was a really just magical, fun evening. And I love those moments in travel. I love those sort of unexpected connective moments where you just you meet strangers and you share this moment in time that just kind of is fantastic. Yeah, I agree. I think the the things we can never plan for are always the ones that I think live in our hearts the yeah. longest because they, they just are really special. Yeah. Um, well, you alluded to this a little bit um, of a uh, of screaming into the woods <laughs> so this is a really <laughs> pivotal moment I think in, yeah. in, in your story and in the book so I wanted to hop back over to there and have you take us through that kind of unexpected walk to the falls where you weren't mm -hmm. really hearing a whisper you were hearing something with a quiet level of intensity and yeah. you knew you couldn't be on this path anymore but I wanted to if you to know if you could just share a little bit about what you were experiencing in that moment of course. So this was two weeks before my wedding. I flew to Buenos Aires and I had flown there for an assignment to write about the cafe scene in Palermo. And while I was there, I met a backpacker who recommended I go to the Iguazu waterfalls, which I'm embarrassed to say I did not know of. And I certainly had not done my research into Argentina. I was just kind of like moving on momentum at that point. And um, when I saw the photos of the waterfalls, I immediately booked a one hour flight to the border of Argentina and Brazil and decided to just go. And at that point in time, it was now a week before my wedding day. And when I was walking in Iguazu National Park, I didn't go there with the intention of confronting myself. I certainly did not plan on doing that. I was just enjoying sort of the magic of solo travel and making a spontaneous travel decision. But when I got there and I was sort of hiking alone through the jungle and I kind of moved away from the crowds that were kind of clogged up around the major waterfalls and I found myself alone, I realized that this was probably the last moment I would have alone with myself before I got back to New York. And I remember the feeling very well. I, I got actual butterflies in my stomach and I got this like queasy nervous feeling because I, I think I knew before I said it, like what was going to happen next. And I knew that if I didn't ask myself what's going on here, like, why am I, what am I running from? Why am I in Argentina when my wedding's in one week? Like if I don't have this conversation with myself, then I'm walking down that aisle. And I remember I asked myself out loud, 
what is it you have to say? And I literally asked it out loud and I screamed into the trees. I don't want to get married. And it wasn't a planned response. I didn't like, I didn't take a beat and think about what I was going to do and then decide I'm going to yell it in the most dramatic fashion. It quite literally was, what is it you have to say? And then the words just flew out of me with such ferocity that I, it, it kind of took me off guard. And I just realized in that moment that everything I had been avoiding and everything that I had been suppressing had just let loose and just bubbled to the surface. And the reason I start the book there, and well, I should say the prologue starts there, and then I sort of rewind and build back up to that moment for the reader. But the reason I really kind of hinge the book on that moment is because that to me is the moment that everything changes. It's the moment I stop running away from myself and stop lying to myself as well as lying to those around me. It's the moment I stop taking a back seat to my own life. And it's the moment that I change everything. I change my career. I change the trajectory of my life by canceling that wedding. I can't, I cancel that engagement. I break that relationship. And so there's a real massive sort of restructuring and course correction that happens as a result of that moment yelling into the trees that to this day defined everything that came. And that happened more than 10 years ago. And I can say that everything I value now from my husband to my pets, to my career, to my home, to my friends, everything that I value, I think came out of that moment because it dramatically threw me on a different course. Yeah. Um, it's such um, a powerful moment. So thank you yeah. for sharing it with us. Of and course. I, I think one of the things too, that struck me as you were saying that was, you know, realizing that you, like you knew you were lying to yourself, right? That's an obvious thing, even if yeah. you weren't consciously acknowledging it, but like kind of in that moment, realizing too, that you were also lying to this whole host of other people. And when you're yeah. kind of caught up in it, it's your story, right? So you're, you're focused on the main character, but I think that yeah. clarity to realize that like, if I go home, it's not just me entering into this marriage with this kind of darkness, clouding over it it's this oh. other person and their family and my family and um I think that takes I think sometimes that's the harder thing to face like it's really actually pretty easy to lie to ourselves yeah um, but when we realize that we're bringing other people into it with us I, I can imagine that that was a really long plane ride home <laughs> yeah and I you know the thing is is that I it was scary it was absolutely terrifying um and I could have just walked down the aisle. And, and that was a question I got quite a lot at that moment in time was, why didn't you just do it? Just walk down the aisle, get divorced on the other side of things, like just do it. And, you know, at the end of the day, I could have, but I didn't, once I confronted myself in that jungle and once I realized that I had been lying not only to myself, but to everyone around me for months. And I had been hiding from myself in the worst possible ways from infidelity to alcoholism to just running away and hiding and travel. Once I realized like how bad I had let things get, I didn't want to lie anymore. It was just like, I was so fed up with myself at that moment in time that the worst thing, the worst thing that I could think of doing next was to stand up in front of everyone I know and love and respect and lie about loving this person and wanting to spend my life with him after having just almost cleared the fog out from over my eyes and realized the truth. And in the end, I have to say that I'm so glad I canceled the wedding because yes, I could have walked down the aisle. Yes, it could have, I could have gone through the wedding and had this whole facade of a thing. But, you know, when I got married this past September, spoiler alert, mm -hmm. <laughs> but when I got married this past September, it was my first time walking down the aisle. And it was my first time standing up there and saying my vows and wearing the white dress. 
in public because I had done wedding dress fittings for the one before, but it was my first time having that moment. And I'm so glad I saved it for my future self because I meant every word and I was happy. And it was, it was a beautiful, beautiful wedding that I felt fully. And there was not an ounce of me that was scared or doubtful or trying to run away. And I'm just so happy that I didn't steal that moment away from my future self out of fear of letting other people down. Mm, that's um, really, really, really powerful and really beautiful. And I really hope that other people can hear that and that can give them um, a different perspective also on, on that. I think that's, that is a really beautiful gift to have that awareness and have given them that to yeah. yourself. You know, because the thing is, is um, I was asked earlier today, actually, I was having a conversation with someone and the question was, why is this an important story that I felt I needed to share beyond the fact that, you know, it's my life and just kind of honoring this period in time. But I thought about that question. And I think the answer is, is that it's very easy to think that if you go so far down a certain road, it's impossible to pull off it. And I think especially as women, we have such a tendency to people please and to not want to let those down around us that we will, you know, stiff upper lip and power through, even if we're not happy, even if we're uncomfortable, even if it doesn't feel right. And I think stories like these are important because they remind us that it's okay to choose ourselves and it's okay to pull your track or pull your car off the road and go a different way because it's your life to live. And that's really the learning here. If, if anybody takes anything away from call you when I land, my hope is that it's a reminder that it's your life. And if you're making decisions to please others, and if you're saying yes, instead of no, and you're walking down roads that you have no desire to walk down, you're the one who ultimately pays. But if you have the strength to change that and to advocate for yourself, then your future becomes yours. And I'm, again, I'm so happy that at that age, I was able to make those decisions, whether or not I knew how they would turn out. I certainly, when I was facing that canceled wedding and calling off everything and leaving my job, I certainly didn't have a guarantee that things would work out. But I'm glad I took those risks because it got me to where I needed to go. Um, I, yeah, I'm like, and in scene. <laughs> um, well, I mean, as you mentioned, um, your story wrapped up like with the perfect happy ending and reading it um, and knowing, you know, knowing your story before the book had even come out. Um, you know, I don't want to share too much. I want readers to definitely read the book. So we're not going to talk really about from that moment to this moment too much. But um, I can just say that, you know, seeing you like posting that you're on this trip to Argentina, kind of knowing your background a little, I was like, oh my God, this could be really cool. This is like, the, this moment <laughs> might be coming. Like all of us are living vicariously through you. And I was like, I hope we see like this post on social, just like watching and watching. And when it happened, I was like, man, oh man, like if she wasn't already writing a book, she better be because yeah. <laughs> this is, it couldn't have been like written and like scripted more beautifully. So congratulations. Thank um, you. Thank on, you very much. <laughs> you know, I was asked the other day, um, because again, I mean, not to give it away, but I'll give it away. <laughs> I already alluded to the wedding, but I was asked the other day, what would I have done if my now husband hadn't proposed? Because that obviously there's such a beautiful agreeable symmetry there where the book starts with canceling this wedding and then it, you know what happens but um you know it was if he hadn't proposed I think I would have ended the book in the same way and you know the way of sort of meeting myself back in the past and kind of just showing gratitude because at the end of the day like the love stories and everything that kind of like ebbs and flows in the book really it's just about one woman's evolution and 
it's because, and this is so weird to talk about myself in third person, but it's yeah. because of that girl that went to Argentina by herself in the worst inopportune time and had the gall and audacity to do what she did and then restructure her life that I am where I am today. And there's so much gratitude there. So at the end of the day, like for as much of a love story as Call You When I Land is and a story about chasing career dreams and everything, it really is also just a story of gratitude for the daunting, scary, brave, outlandish decisions that we dare to make when we're younger that have ripple effects throughout our adult life. Yeah. Um, gosh. And I, I think not all of us get to to pay this respect to ourselves yeah. and our choices. So that's kind of where I wanted to go with this before we end our conversation um, are, are two, um, two questions, I guess. Like, what was it like for you to actually write this journey And then also, what was it like for you to be sharing this when you were getting married? So I don't know if you knew this when you like set the date for when the book would be released, but this all kind of happened serendipitously or, you know, I don't know. Um, But what, what has that been like for you to not only like reflect, but then also kind of be able to celebrate as you're sharing this in this way? Yeah. I mean, the first question, writing the book was, I'm, I think the popular answer for most memoirists is cathartic, which it absolutely was. It was cathartic, um, vulnerable as all hell to go out there and share these stories. Because the thing is, is that I, I really love the genre of women's memoir. And the reason I love women's memoir so much is that it has such a tendency to pull readers into a woman's mistakes and sort of drag them through the mud and show readers the worst of us so we can get you to appreciate the best of us. And that's what I wanted to do here. Call You When I Land gets uncomfortable, as you well know. It pulls you into less into mistakes I make. It pulls you into affairs and, and all sorts of things that are going on that you're like, oh man, you know, girl, get it together. <laughs> But there's no appreciating the journey and where I've come if you don't know where it started. And there was a real vulnerability that, to that, the vulnerability being showing those mistakes, showing those flaws, showing the mishaps and the missteps and, and what I did in my 20s that I'm not necessarily proud of, but how they ultimately shaped me and got me to where I needed to go. And since the book has come out, There's a real magic to seeing how people have taken that story and made it their own. And I think that's also the power of memoir as well, that when you write a memoir, my story is no longer my story. It's your story. And whatever resonates with you, whatever inspires you or empowers you, these words are now yours to make your own. And there's been a real lovely magic to seeing readers come to book events and reach out on social media to tell me about their own stories and what Call You When I Land did to help either inspire them or resonate or comfort. And so many memoirs that I grew up reading did the same for me. And I really uh, appreciate and do not take lightly that awesome responsibility to be able to impact someone's life in a wonderful way. But I will say, having written a book about calling off a wedding and all that comes after in tandem with planning a wedding was really surreal. I mean, we had mentioned disconnect, connect in the world of travel. That was a real disconnect, connect. And all I could keep thinking was, I can't believe I did that. Because keep in mind, this time going with wedding planning, I was all in. I mean, every step of the way, I'm on the phone with florists and DJs, and I'm like, I have this insane Excel spreadsheet. I'm like in it in a way that I was not back then. And so I just kept thinking along the way, like, I can't believe I called off a wedding of this magnitude a week before the big day. And there was a level of awe as well as guilt because you know, I, I planned that wedding, the first wedding with my mom, I planned this last wedding with my mom and it just felt 
you know, I could see how much pain it would have caused her, how much it did cause her for me to pull the rug out from under her like that. Not only financially, that was a doozy in and of itself, but emotionally that I hadn't been forthcoming with her about what was going on, but also because I wasn't able to be forthcoming with myself. And so there was a real righting of the wrongs that happened this time of being able to plan the wedding with my mom and for it to be honest and enjoyable and a lovely process that culminated in the perfect wedding day. And it just feels like the ultimate sense of closure that, okay, now it's done. The story's been told, the wounds have been healed, we're good, and I can move on. <laughs> yeah, I and I can imagine that you know, not everybody gets that sense of closure that happens simultaneously with this process of sharing their memoir. So I just think, again, from the outside perspective, I was like, I can only imagine what is happening right now. <laughs> but it, it seemed even more beautiful and powerful. And, you know, to even know that that's like where the story landed as as yeah. the other story was landing, you know, it was really powerful. And I loved what you said about um, women's memoirs, too, because I think, I don't know if I didn't notice them before, but as I've aged and I've started reading them and I witness people's journeys, I realize how important it is. And you you have those moments, like I think so many of us have laid on the floor with Liz Gilbert and we have yes, like, yes. we've known, we're like, oh my God, me too. And even the very first time reading one of those books, I think it was Glennon Doyle's book was the first one I read where I like witnessed that vulnerability and that truth mm. and I was like I had no idea we could do it I was like oh my gosh this is incredible like we can actually tell our real story we don't yes. have to hide we we can be who we are like um like you said we can take part of someone else's story and and make it our own or we can learn how to see our story through yeah. someone else's and and see the parts we were maybe not brave enough to witness um, in our own, which I think even just in talking with you that that moment with that little girl, like when she said that yeah. to you, I kind of felt like she was saying it to me, you know, like it really resonated. And I love it's that so important when we when we when you are writing something like this to realize yeah. that that you're creating something for somebody else. No, I, I love that so much. And I think what you said is exactly right. These memoirs, they give you permission to make mistakes and to be flawed and to course correct. And I remember reading Cheryl Strayed's Wild when I was in Argentina at that moment in time, running away from my wedding and literally like sleeping with her book against my chest because it felt like a friend who got it, who understood what it's like to let your life sort of free fall for fear of making a decision or confronting a truth. And I see the power of those memoirs and I really wanted to call you when I land to pay homage to that because those memoirs meant so much to me and held my hand through so many tough moments. And I hope call you when I land can do the same. And I understood that in writing this, the ultimate disservice I could do to the reader and myself was to not be honest about the darker parts of my story. And I wanted to really be vulnerable there. And I think that, you know, I had read a quote when I set out to write the book that said, an approximation of honesty won't cut it when it comes to writing a memoir. You either are going to tell the story as it is or don't tell it at all. And and that was the thing. And and there's a lot of editing that goes on to memoirs. And obviously it's not, you know, it's not just a dumping of your diary. You have to choose a moment in time and kind of, you know, tailor it for readers. But even with all the editing and the cooks in the kitchen and the publishers and everything, I really wanted it to be raw and candid. And, and, I, and I hope it is because it's in that raw vulnerability that people really connect. And we all see the success stories. Our entire social media is curated success stories, but it's that part, the dark part, the part where you share how you fell and how you got up and when it looked ugly, those are the parts that are inspiring that make you appreciate the success. And I just will hope that the book does that. Yeah. Thank you. And I know that's something that people have really resonated with on um, listening to the podcast too, is hearing 
the story of how so many women who are really inspiring leaders in travel got there. And I, like you said, I think it's so important that they see that, you know, they were this 19 year old who wasn't sure about this and this 30 year old working in corporate who felt yeah. like they were dying. Like all those parts are really important. A hundred percent. Yeah. 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 And the thing about those, and I could talk to you forever, (laughs) but you know, the thing about those stories too, it's like, I love those stories, like the evolution, like career evolution. But the thing also is like a lot of times, like those stories, they still skip over the ugly parts. You know, it's like, well, I had a dream and then I chased said dream and it was so far out of reach, but then I got it. And now here I am. And it's like, but it's still not showing you at your ugliest. And that's important too. It's okay to show a little bit of the ugly side. And it's, you know, it's not that I love talking about the fact that I called off a wedding or that I, you know, had affairs or quit jobs or got lost jobs or was unemployed. Like these are not pretty parts of the picture, but they are necessary to understand holistically where the image stands today. And I think that those ugly parts that we tend to curate out of the image and cut out of our stories for fear of judgment, those are really the parts that matter because that shows your resilience and that shows your evolution. And I hope that more people learn to embrace those parts of their story. That's what's inspiring. Yeah, thank you. Well, I know we're running over on time. This is clearly why you've already been back to the podcast four times because we could keep talking forever. And I I love that so much um, about the time that we get to spend together. Um, We've done rapid fires together. So I I don't want to do those again, but I do have three kind of last rapid fire-ish questions just to wrap up. And then I want to share with our listeners where they can see you um, in the new year. Uh, the first question, and we've maybe already heard the answer to this, but what is your favorite travel memoir? Oh gosh. Um, I feel like I always fail at these rapid fires because they end up being long-winded questions. Uh, I love Wild by Cheryl Strayed. That's absolutely my number one. Yeah, me too. Uh, have you met her? I feel like you must have. I did. Yes. We actually had a zoom call. I had the pleasure of interviewing her for photos travel and, uh, I would love to meet her in person. Yeah, me too. And also wishing for her to be here on this podcast. So (laughs) someday maybe we'll have like the best. Yeah. Manifest it. (laughs) Yes. We'll put it out there. Uh, What travel quote is one that you always come back to? Uh, The quote that I love is to travel is to live, which is part of the larger Hans Christian Andersen quote to move to fly. Oh my gosh. I don't remember the quote. Let's just say to travel is to live. I have it printed on the bottom of this world map where I place pins and the Hans Christian Andersen quote that it's a part of, which is escaping me right now is actually in the book. Yeah. Um, but it's a quote that the last line my mom had printed on a map that she gave to me and it, uh, she gave it to me when I first started out on my travel journey. Yeah. I have it highlighted somewhere in the book and I can't find it either to share it, but we'll share it. Yeah. In the show notes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the last one, which I hope you've already thought of, but if your book is made into a movie and I hope it is because I can't wait to see it, oh my gosh. um, who would you wish would play you? <laughs> wow. Okay. This is a very specific niche reference. So I don't know if you've seen the show, the bold type. I really love the bold type. It's, it was this great show about like three women navigating New York. And one of the lead actresses is named Katie Stevens. And she's actually of Portuguese descent. And her and I have kind of similar looks. I might be flattering myself here, but we look somewhat similar. And I think that she's really great. And she has a way of pairing like emotion and, and just like a poignant gravitas with her acting while also sort of being like fun. I think she would be awesome for the role and uh, manifesting yeah. Katie Stevens. <laughs> okay. We're putting lots of, lots yeah. of energy out to the universe today, but man, as I read it, I'm like, I already see the movie. So I think it's fine. <laughs> we should just go ahead and do this. Yes. Um, yeah. So uh, coming into the new year, you're going to be out promoting the book. Do you want to share uh, where you'll be and where people can find you? Yes. So in January, I leave on the second half of my book tour I will be going to Portland, Oregon, to the famous Powell's City of Books. My event is on January 20th. 
with Emmy nominated travel host and award winning photographer Rachel Rudwall. It's free to attend. So please join me if you're in Oregon. And then I'll be in Los Angeles for two events one at Romans, that's with a V, and another at Zibby's Bookshop in Santa Monica. You can find all of that information and more on NikkiVargas.com or on Instagram. You can follow me at NickNackVargas. Excellent. Uh, I hope that somehow you're forced to come to Denver because I would love to see you here. Uh, there's a great book. We'll throw that or a great book star called Tattered Cover, which is also in the Denver airport. So while we're manifesting things, I'll just throw that onto the list. Love it. Love it. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much for being here again. Thank you so much for sharing your story with me and my listeners and for writing a book that I think really is going to resonate with so many readers. I, I'm really um, really glad to have shared this with you. Thank you so much for having me again. Yes. <laughs> Here's to next time. <laughs> yes, to next time. Thank you. Uh...